Well, thank you very much first, Dr. Timmy and Dr. Nancy for inviting me here, the entire PIDSP, and of course, uh, the group of Meru Foundation, uh, Dr. Pico, Valentina, and Marian, and everyone here. I'm happy to be here now, uh, maybe not as a media person <laughs> anymore, showbiz, but I, I will be sharing with you some information, the results of systematic analysis, meta-analysis, on immunogenicity. Sorry, I have to move this. Oh, wait, wait, what happened there? Well, that's right, okay. Uh, on the immunogenicity and efficacy of the COVID vaccines in the pediatric and adult uh, populations. So it was a little difficult for me to put together all of this information, why? Uh, why is it not moving? There, ah, okay, so it's not moving here. It's there, it's all right. Ah, I can, it's all right. I, I'm just, uh, I thought it will also come out here. So even before we consider the performance of all of these vaccines, there are certain things we have to know. So for, for example, it's very difficult to compare one vaccine with another head-to-head -head direct comparisons could not be made. That's very clear from the very start, but people just got confused and had to you know, go for certain brands. So this could not be made for these COVID-19 vaccines as they differ or vary in platforms. As you know, here in the Philippines, we approved nine vaccines for four different platforms. Uh, Dr. Kisha is saying yes. I think that gave her group the chance to, you know, open up to, to really deploy a lot of vaccines back then. So there are so many platforms. Oh, why is it moving on its own? What is happening? Ah, it's this one. It's, it's moving forward. I'm not finished with the first one. Yeah, the other one, yes, right. Yes, yes, so it's only that one, yeah, sorry. I was trying to move it here from here. So anyway, different platforms, different antigens, it's either the whole virus or the subunit, the spike mostly or RBD. The dose, of course, the, there are different doses of the, antigen, the vaccines, the number of doses, the interval between doses, so it's very, very difficult to really compare them. And the, when they did their clinical trials, there were different populations tested. So the age group, whether general population, the elderly, the children stratified further into the young, the old, the adolescents. Then the health status, you had the healthy population, the immunocompromised, and then maybe relevant more relevant to our immunogenicity topic for this morning is the immune response measurements. When we were uh, reviewing or evaluating the clinical trial applications, there were just so many methods that these vaccine companies use. So are they actually harmonized or standardized? That we had to know. Of course, not, not in the beginning. And then do we look at the biological standards? Of course, yes. And then how about correlates of protection? Then looking at primary and secondary endpoints to determine the efficacy of these vaccines. And then later on, as you will see, some effects of the waning immunity and the emergence of the variants of concern. So all of these affected the efficacy, the effectiveness of these vaccines. So it's still not working. Ah, yes, so it's there. So just, just one uh, slide to let you know that we now have, after I think almost a year, uh, finally the WHO international standard for anti-SARS-CoV-2 immunoglobulin was established uh, with the unit age assigned around 250 international units per ampule. So all of these vaccines should have been standardized against this. 
So, but we know that the data that we have, some of these vaccines, uh, uh, vaccines have not been standardized. Okay, so there's a little problem there. So I'll start now with the immunogenicity and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines in the general adult healthy population. So this is a little small, but just to show you, the very first vaccines actually that uh, were con that conducted uh, cl clinical trials found that the currently developed, so in the Philippines, maybe all seven of them that we are using would differ significantly in their effectiveness and safety. So I don't know if you see this, but everyone knows, at least here in the Philippines, for the mRNA vaccines, they have the highest efficacy at around 94 to 95%. Then we have the adenovirus uh, vaccine that actually we had many different um, vectors as well, so they differed in their performance. So for the AstraZeneca, it's about 70.4. When they use a low dose and a longer interval, they got a 90% efficacy. But when they use the standard dose and shorter interval, it went down to 60%. Then we have the, they cannot see much. Uh, the inactivated, we had some problems, sorry. We had some problems with the, oh, oh what's happening? There. Okay, so for the inactivated, again, we have Sinovac here. We had Sinopharma, although not too many people got Sinopharma. But the, then there were these questions on efficacy at 50 point something percent in Brazil for Sinovac but 80 to 90% in Turkey, and uh, I think somewhere in Indonesia or UAE in between. So all of these uh, data are rather confusing for people to follow. Then we have also the relatively newer, although we do not have it here, the recombinant uh, form uh, from Novavax, which gave very high efficacy at around 90%. Okay, so part of this study that made, uh, that was a systematic study, discussed about neutralizing antibodies. We all know that neutralizing antibodies are correlated with protection. So what is it that we want to prevent either asymptomatic infection, infection, mild, moderate, severe, critical uh, care, or even protection against death. So the level of neutralizing antibodies are actually correlated with protection. And uh, before I go into the levels of the, the geometric mean titers of the neutralizing antibodies across different vaccines here, I'd like to uh, explain the Cowrie paper, which is actually a modeling on uh, neutralizing antibody levels being highly protective of immune protection from symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. You note here, this is more sort of classic for me. Not that everything that you see here is really true, because as I said, there are many, many factors and uh, to consider in actually comparing them. So down the line, when you have lower neutralizing antibodies, midway and up there, the protection goes up as well. So up for most of these vaccines, mRNA, Novavax, that, that's past, uh, Pfizer and Moderna there and down for, uh, actually for the, some of the adeno, the vector-based and the inactivated. So, it really moves, it moves. <laughs> okay. So this particular study by Het et al. in 2021 had this uh, um, neutralizing antibodies really, really spelled out. So especially saying that the recombinant protein vaccines, Clover, I think it the Philippine, uh, Philippine, uh, our Philippine clinical trialists uh, did that study. Dr. Lulu Bravo, I think, headed that, and they had the highest, 3,320 GNT. Novavax was even a higher. And then why, why we had this lower 
for GM trees for the mRNA, I really could not understand it. But that is how He et al. and his uh, authors actually reported it. So for the various inactivated vaccines, the GMT varied from 50 to about 300. So the highlights from this uh, paper is that all reported VEs actually are higher than the 50% criterion required by the WHO. So given that you have 50 to 95, for as long as 50 was reached, then that is WHO uh, approved already uh, by WHO, FDA, and EMA. So it indicates that the currently approved COVID-19 vaccines we are, are efficacious enough against symptomatic COVID-19 in the early stage after vaccination. So later on, you will see the waning immunity after three months, four months, five months also. The VE reported for the elderly population in this paper was also uh, shown to be relatively lower. And we have problems there because, they, of course, they are more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 and show a higher death rate. But clearly saying that the evidences for the VE can be unreliable due to complicated demographic characteristics of the participants in the clinical trials, such as population and geography, the VE being generalized from diverse settings with the dose and dosage influencing the efficacy of the vaccine. A single dose, J and J, and for the others, two doses, and then later, for Pfizer, they said for the younger, very young children, at least three doses for the primary. And the interval between doses actually really uh, made a lot of difference as well. So now we go into the older adults, meaning more than 55, 60, 65, about. So they ha we have this paper by Li et al wherein they studied uh, randomized controlled trials from inception very early on to April 2, 2020. So systematically searched PubMed, all of this, no? And then the, there were nine studies analyzed for efficacy, 21 for immunogenicity. And most of these data showed, uh, were reported 14 to 28 days after the last vaccine administration across at least seven vaccines. There were seven. So we have here the summary data, VE for those seven, summary, uh, against COVID in older adults, meaning more than 55 years old, was around 79 to 80%. Zero conversion was good at 92.6%. GMT, now they use the standard uh, median difference for the GMT because they had to cover for the different methods used in testing for neutralizing antibodies. So this was at 3.56 for neutralizing antibodies and with the protection rate against severe form at 87%. Now, they were quick to put in that <laughs> place there that mRNA vaccines showed the best efficacy at 90, more than 90 percent, had the highest zero conversion rate at 98.55 percent, with a GMT higher than what you had you, for the overall, which is 3.56. The mRNA vaccines had a GMT or SMD of 6.2. So the overall conclusion was that these vaccines were accept, had acceptable efficacy and immunogenicity in older people, providing protection, especially against severe disease. So this puts together some of this data from the same paper. Uh, for the different vaccines, I just included the ones we have here in the Philippines, Astra, uh, actually CanSino we have not used, but uh, it is included here. Then we have Novavax, Sputnik, we have J&J, &J, Moderna, and Pfizer. 
So these were the original VE that we saw until the, of course, the variance emerged. So from the lowest here was at 53 and 55%, and the highest was around 91%, 92%. Now for adolescents, children, and infants, so again, I just put in summary slides here. So this, I uh, looked at systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials in children and adolescents. So COVID-19 vaccines were evaluated in a total of around 11,000 children and adolescents in seven published studies and over 49,000 participants in 26 at that time of the publication, ongoing randomized controlled trials. Now, only descriptive findings are included. So in terms of efficacy, the investigation, the investigated mRNA vaccines, these were the very first ones that were given to uh, children, as you know, no? was found to be 90.7 to 100% efficacious in preventing COVID-19 among children and adolescents revealing, of course, good efficacy profiles in this age group. So high protection against COVID-19. And in this review, the RNA vaccines exhibited over 90% efficacy after the second dose in clinical trials in this age group five to 17 years. No data yet for the six months to less than five years. So demonstrating, well, of course, that the policy of mass vaccination of children and adolescents seems reasonable and feasible. Additionally, the Pfizer vaccine was found among people, so they have different age groups that they would give data no, to. So age 12 to 18 years, based on data from real world, this is now real world effectiveness, real world condition. So against SARS-CoV infection, 92%, against hospitalization, just a little higher at 93%, against multi-system inflammation syndrome, the MIS-C syndrome, 91%. Now I also included, not too many people actually are aware of the Sinovac data for children. We actually approved Sinovac here in the Philippines for the age group, I think six years above. So in DIPA, although the data they have is up to three years, and they were actually working on six months, but no, no data that we saw. So for Sinovac, we look at the zero conversion rate. Um, this is for, sorry, I cannot see anymore. So it's more or less 100%, at least more than 90%, up to 100%. Take note here, they use two doses, 1.5, and three microgram doses. And of course, as you expect, and these are the age groups stratified, all ages three to 17, then we have the three to five years old, six to 11 years old, and 12 to 17 years old age group. So the neutralizing antibody titer in both phase one and phase two trials were of course higher than the, uh, for the three microgram dose than the 1.5. And this mi three microgram dose is the one that was actually eventually used. So that's all seen in those uh, graphs. Then we have this uh, study on adenospike vaccines, but this is CanSino. It's adenophile plus spike. So they have this zero conversion data and T cell data on the six to 17 years clumped together and then the 18 to 55 year old age group, so the general adult population, and those more than 56 years. I don't know if you can actually see it, but the younger age group, so this is the six to 17 years old, had higher zero conversion rates, around 80 to 90%, and then in the middle age group, this is your general population that was a little lower and much lower for the 56 years old. So actually not too many vaccines show this kind of data, but 
for this Cancino one, they showed a decreasing trend for zero conversion with age. But the T cell response was higher at the 28 post vaccination <coughs> sustained up to 84 day, day, days. Sorry, had to finish. <coughs> Immunogenicity and efficacy in children, and this is from Gao et al. They also studied uh, 13 eligible studies and uh, seven RCTs, three cohort studies, three cross-sectional. For the first dose, the effectiveness of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine against SARS-CoV infection was 88.5%, but pulled COVID-19, so all the endpoints, 84.3%. For the second dose, it was higher at 91.6 and 92.7% respectively. <clears throat> so again, <clears throat> the conclusion is that the vaccines can be effective to prevent oh, thank you. Uh, infection among children and adolescents. But all of these data are still limited, especially for children. You know, the children were given the vaccines much later. so. And more basic research and clinical trials are still needed to explore vaccine effectiveness and immunogenicity. So I also wanted just to include this. I was particularly uh, interested in finding out more about this uh, meta-analysis performed to compare the peak levels of neutralizing antibodies across candidate vaccines. Why? I saw here that they, they use Sucra here you know, a level above one would be would be best fit, meaning it is good. It reaches the peak neutralizing antibody levels best. So we have listed, they have listed here several vaccines that have very high neutralizing antibodies that belong to ito nga, more than 1.5 to 2. We have their Sinopharma, Astra, Pfizer, I'm not clear about New Crown. I'm not, we're not familiar with that. Then Sputnik is up there. In the middle is, um, what's this? Coronavac, which is Sinovac, Novavax, mRNA, and Adeno-5, which is CanSino. And down the line is Adeno-26, I think. That is J&J. Uh, &J. So just showing all of this. So, well, still, we're looking at the same, more or less the same data for the same vaccines. Now for real world effectiveness, just a few things here. Real world conditions, uh, Zeng et al. had this very um, uh, comprehensive paper on uh, the overall result uh, on 51 records from 14 countries included in this meta-analysis. So in fully vaccinated populations, the VE reported was for, again, for infection, 89.1, higher against hospitalization, 97.2, admission to intensive care, 97.4, death, 99. If you remember, these were the same, almost the same data that we saw from the, the RCTs, the clinical trials. So efficacy versus effectiveness. And then VE against infection by age group and also included Healthcare workers was at uh, 86.1 for the general population, 83.8 for the elderly, and high for the healthcare workers, which are of course in the general healthy group, 95.3%. And if you look by vaccine type or brand, um, Moderna and Pfizer are still up there, but uh, Moderna had higher effectiveness and we have CoronaVac was at 65, but still that's acceptable. And they have shown data on Delta variant. VE was only 59 after two doses and AstraZeneca had varying um, VEs. But the conclusion was that the COVID-19 vaccines are highly protective against SARS-CoV-2 related diseases in real world settings. Sorry, I'm taking so long. So just to also add that uh, the VE against infectiousness, this is against infectiousness, 80% after single dose of Pfizer. For Moderna, single dose could reduce potential transmission by 61%. And a single dose of uh, Adeno-26 is J&J, &J, 
68.1, but this is against gamma variant. So the general conclusions on the real world effectiveness studies, these are consistent with the results of the phase three clinical trials and the effectiveness of vaccines against co confirmed COVID-19 infection in real world conditions also varied per vaccine. So overall, the results suggest that available vaccines currently approved for use have a good protective effect against the major outcomes, especially critical COVID-19. So when the, well, of course, we understand about waning immunity and the emergence of variants, we do not see much of this, but they tried all of the vaccines, they tested, looked at the data for all of the vaccines against the variants, and most of them were down in terms of um, neutralizing antibodies. But what is clear right now, and I thank Dr. Jean Solante for these slides, is that protection against symptomatic COVID-19 decreases over time, but during Omicron, protection against severe disease has remained or is preserved. So we see that, no? Down there for the, be, be, for the, uh, wait, this is for the symptomatic, without the variant, with the variants, and then for the severe disease, the symptomatic and for severe disease, and then showing here the same, um, sustenance, the preservation of the protection against severe disease. Sorry, just my last slide, key take home messages. We have varying platforms, antigen content, number of doses, interval between doses, RCT conducted at different times, during the early surges or when circulating variants of concern, during different times, different population groups, and so on. So therefore, I again say head-to-head -head direct comparisons could not be made for these COVID-19 vaccines. Immunogenicity measurements and efficacy endpoints vary. So the general observation so far, we have seen that the current COVID-19 vaccines are effective, are less effective at blocking infection or transmission because of these variants and more especially because of the Omicron variants, but we, we uh, highlight or reiterate that protection against severe critical COVID disease remains largely preserved or sustained. So, so far, real world effectiveness is good with higher protection against severe COVID across ages consistent with the RCT data. But looking uh, forward, waning immunity and emergence of variants require that COVID-19 vaccines and boosters be continuously evaluated for, now we are seeing that these neutralizing antibody titers are really only for the short term. We have to look at the durability of anti -response, antibody responses versus the T cell responses, of course, memory B and T cell responses, and looking at updating vaccines to be more inclusive and provide broader protection versus current or future variant. So with that, thank you very much for your kind attention. Sorry, it took me a long time.